Today, we have the privilege of being joined by Dr. Okafor Yarwood. She is a lecturer and an expert in maritime security um, in the Gulf of Guinea. She currently works at uh, St. Andrews University in the UK. Thank you um, for joining us today, Doctor. We're excited to, uh, to get your insight. Thank you so much for having me. So that let's just jump right into some of the some of the questions that we have. The first one is, what do you see as some of the key challenges facing the Gulf of Guinea um, in the continued fight against piracy um, and maritime crime? Um, thank you so much for the question. If you asked me this question um, a couple of years ago, or maybe let's say five years ago, the first response might relate to lack of information. You know, mm -hmm. lack of access to information, lack of data on what is going on at sea. But thankfully, today you're asking a question. And so the right response to that would be that the limitation of assets. So being able to actually interdict is one of the biggest limitations. And this is not really a problem on its own in that no one nation, not even Europe, not even the United States have the ability to monitor what goes on in their exclusive economic zone alone without cooperation or collaboration with others. And so the issue then is the limitation of assets and then being not being able to coordinate the use of these assets, you know, by those that have coordinating and working with those that do not have. And so I feel that this is the biggest challenge at the regional level. And then at the international level, because of course, international level also affects what happens in the region, given the international nature of some of the crime that we experience in the region, especially piracy. So at the international level, you could then say the lack of um, cooperation and collaboration. And I will say this in terms of sharing information, because a lot of the times, of course, with what happens, some of the information goes to entities outside the region. As such, mm -hmm. without that information trickling down to the region as soon as it needs to, even with the limited asset that is available, they might not be able to then be able to address the problem as it is going on. So at the regional level, I can say the limitation around um, assets for interdiction, and then coupled with at the international level, the lack of cooperation and co collaboration, especially as it relates to sharing information together, compounds the whole um, regional ability to um, address the threats of piracy and other maritime um, crimes in, in the region. As we've seen over the past few years, we've seen kind of a reduction in rates and piracy and maritime crime within this region. What do you think is the primary driver behind that? Um, thank you again for this uh, question. I think also my response to the first question then relates to some of the success we've seen in relation to how I'm going to answer this question. So we now see increasingly cooperation and collaboration, <laughs> you see, by nations, be, be it at the national level, at the regional level, and also at the international level. Some of the examples of, uh, you know, successful interdictions or even success stories, I will give the example of Hei Lung Feng, for instance, although it relates to um, attack on, on a fishing vessel in 2020, but it was due to cooperation and coordination nation between the Nigerian Navy, the Ivorian Navy, and different um, maritime sec sectors that are across different nations that were able to communicate and they were able to successfully arrest these pirates. And this actually led to the second persecution for Nigeria under the SPOMO, SPOMO Act being the um, Piracy Act. So the, the, the fact that the region is increasingly, I guess you could say, implementing the provisions of the Yaoundé Agreement, which was signed in 2013, and cooperating and collaborating have meant that they're able to then reduce the numbers and work effectively. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the fact that at the international level, they've been able to cooperate, they've been able to communicate, they've been able to coordinate, and they've been also able to support in terms of their own patrols, because we know the internet, there's international presence around uh, patrols at the different uh, high seas within the region. And so this, as a collective, have helped with the reduction of the numbers. And so this also then tells us when this is absent, you could see why we have um, increased incidence of piracy and rear sea and other maritime threats. But when this is present, you can see how we might have more reduction 
Additionally, mm -hmm. I must add also, of course, the fact that when it comes to crime, and this is just an honest response, so when it comes to crime, when you are pushing criminals away from a particular crime, for instance, if you're enforcing or reinforcing the, some of the approaches or processes to ensure that a particular crime is addressed, the criminals would almost always look elsewhere. And what we are seeing is that as pirates incident is decreasing, we are also seeing some of the incident that might have reduced in the past, perhaps due to um, the low cost of energy in the past. But now we're seeing that like the energy cost is increasingly on the rise, especially when it, in, in terms of uh, petroleum products. And so we're seeing, interestingly, that a lot of the criminals are also becoming creative and moving to other crimes. So it's also important to balance this statement to say that whilst we have seen increased cooperation and collaboration between agencies at the national, regional and international level, we're also seeing that the criminals are unfortunately moving elsewhere. For instance, when it comes to, um, we're seeing more incidents of uh, illegal oil bunkering or oil theft. And we're also seeing more successful or attempted incidents of drugs trafficking as well. So mm -hmm. the criminals are obviously becoming more creative as we drive them away from one threat to another crime. Which which absolutely makes sense when you look at, you know, how criminals operate is they're not going to say, well, we can't do piracy, so we're just going to shut that down and we're not going to do anything else. So it, it's interesting to see that that change in dynamic. One of the one of the things you mentioned was, you know, the issues with the number of deployable assets that are in the region. There's some international help with that. Um, to what extent? Um, can the integrated national security and waterways protection infrastructure, the Deep Blue project, be said to be an effective tool in, you know, reducing the the crime and piracy within this uh, within this area? Um, when it is fully integrated, it will it will help when it is fully integrated because the reality is that the deep blue at the Nemasa level is still integrating with Nigeria Navy's Falcon Eye. So the Nemasa mm -hmm. and Nigeria Navy are still integrated. When they are fully integrated, I think that they would be able to do um, a lot more effective work than they are currently doing. But we're actually seeing evidence of their ability of the Navy to be able to work effectively and actually lead as an example that the Gulf of Guinea countries are able to secure their waters when the right um, assets and information and the right support is there. To the point that Nigeria is no longer designated uh, a, um, a piracy hotspot across the region and this has been the case for over a year so there is actually evidence that the navy have been very effective in terms of the assets that is available to them the way they are sharing information and the way they've been able to use those assets in relation to deep blue because you mentioned it i think it's important for me to note that the deep blue which is Nemasa and the Nigerian Navy are still integrating. And once the boat agencies are integrated fully, I think they'll be able to work even uh, um, sort of as a, a better collective or a better um, um, collaborative tool between the agencies, not just for Nigeria, but for the rest of the Gulf of Guinea as well, in terms of being able to share uh, quick information and then being able to um, interdict quite swiftly or using the tools that are available to them. But I mean, in a nutshell, I think the best response to that would be that given that you mentioned integration, the two agencies are still integrating, but based on the evidence that is already available and, and the way that the Nigerian Navy have been able to contribute to reducing the number of piracy in Nigeria water, it is likely that it's going to be even more effective in the way that it supports the rest of the region. So let's talk about from a regional perspective a little bit. Um, to what extent do you feel are the frameworks such as the Yuande Code of Conduct and the Lome Charter still relevant within the Gulf of Guinea? Um, I think that it's very relevant. Both of them are very relevant. So on the one hand, we have the Lome Charter, which unfortunately it's supposed to be a legally binding document. But not, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the last time I read about it, only two countries have actually ratified it. It's supposed to be like an African Union, African wild thing. And if out of uh, 55 countries or 38 coastal states on the continent, only two have ratified, and this was as of last year or 2021, then it's very problematic. 
And so it is effective to the point that countries have taken it seriously or ratified or implementing its provisions. But there are potentials there. Why is there potentials there? Because Loma Charter does not only look at, you know, looking at maritime threats from the securitized response or response that is based only on the use of armament, but it also takes into account the root causes, you know, addressing the root causes of some of the security threats, which would be the ideal because a lot of communities, a lot of people that are engaged in crime might have actually gotten to that point because of the privation, because of different issues. And so Lome Chata allows not only for us to address maritime threats from um, with the application of, you know, maritime law enforcement, but also taking into account some of the causes or the, uh, of issues that affect the coastal communities, for instance, be it fisheries issues and then ensuring mm -hmm. sustainable exploitation of fisheries, ensuring that there is no marine pollution or issues like that are addressed. And so the fact that, unfortunately, many of the countries that have not ratified it, it then means that it's not necessarily being used by them as a tool for maritime security or maritime governance. And then on the other hand, we have the Yaoundé uh, Code of Conduct, which you have to say to a very large extent have been a very effective tool in the way that it has brought different countries and different regions together to work as a collective. And at the time of talking to you, we know that um, Zondi is operationalized, which is based in Cameroon, I believe. And then Zone E is also operationalized, which is based in Benin Republic. Zone F is operationalized, which is based in Ghana. Zone G, uh, they've signed the headquarters agreement, is meant to be based in Praia in Cabo Verde. And Zone A is is due to be based in Angola. It has not been operationalized because they are waiting for the headquarters to be uh, appropriately identified. But we know that the Yaoundé Agreement has been working in terms of how it has allowed for countries to cooperate, to coordinate. And, you know, for the first time, we can absolutely say that the lack of information is not a problem. When something happens at sea in the region, you can say that we're receiving this information at record times. The limitation then is how are we able to use the information we're getting to stop criminals from acting or, or doing what they are doing. So I feel that the Yaoundé Agreement have really achieved a lot and, and given the right support, it has the potential to to be replicated not just at the African continent level, but all the regions actually can learn lessons from it. There are still limitations, of course, around countries or governments walking the talk in terms of providing their law enforcement agencies and different agents the right information they need in terms of uh, providing laws, because once you um, capture criminals, you need to make sure that you have the right laws to be able to prosecute them. Otherwise, it's, it's not necessary. I mean, it becomes... Um, useless, the whole idea of mm -hmm. arresting people. What do you do with them if you do not have the right laws, for instance? So there's still a lot more that needs to be done, providing the right support, which is not happening at certain level in different countries. And this could be because countries do not have the well with us. So for example, you do not ha um, expect a country like Sao Tome and Principe, a small island nation, to be able to um, support or provide support in the way that a Ghana or Cameroon or Equatorial Guinea would be able to. And you also do not expect a country like uh, Abu Verde or Benin Republic, which is also affected by piracy, since we're talking about piracy, to be able to provide in the same way that a Nigeria would be able to, in which case this is where international support could be needed, you know, in sort of filling some of those gaps. And they've been doing it. But then the question is, to what extent are they doing it or to what extent is their support coordinated to ensure that there is no replication and waste mm -hmm. of resources, which is what we might be seeing in some cases. Thank you. Well, that leads that that leads right into my next question, which is a which is a great segue is, you know, what role should the international community be playing in safeguarding the maritime interests within this region of the Gulf of Guinea? Um, the international community have a very important role to play because um, a lot of the times I would say that they have the information, they have the assets, they have the financial well with thou, and they also have the technical knowledge sometimes to guide a lot of these countries to do the right thing. But the reality is then that from this person's perspective, this is my perspective and the <laughs> research that I've been doing on my work, they seem to be very selective. And I mean, you don't even, they don't hide it. You see it openly in terms of 
what is prioritized as an issue. So, for instance, we know that nations would almost always seek to protect their respective national interests. So, in which case, when we talk about maritime threats, you could say that the international community might prioritize piracy and Marbella Sea because they don't want goods uh, or oil and any other resources that is coming from the region to their parts of the world to be disrupted, for instance, the flow of uh, inflow and outflow of resources to be disrupted. It has impact at the regional level, of course, because mm -hmm. goods would be expensive. But at the same time, you don't understand then the logic of how the same priority, the same attention is not given to issues of pollution, for instance, by multinational oil companies that are many of them are from foreign entities. So the same attention is not necessarily given to crimes or threats that is um, um, perpetrated by foreign entities at the international level. We can also talk about illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing in the region, which is a very big problem. And if you talk about the nexus between, you know, criminality at sea and deprivation in coastal communities, and if we assume, research have actually shown that there's a connection between deprivation in, in coastal communities as a root cause, for some of the insecurity we see in the region. And so if this were to be valid, why do you or how do you then justify that almost all the time, the kind of support that is provided suggests that the international community prioritizes the issue of piracy, which is perpetrated um, by regional actors, but not other threats such as pollution and illegal fishing, which is perpetrated by foreign and international actors even though they have the well without. So I feel that the international community can do more. Whilst, of course, nations have to consider their respected national interests, they can do more by providing support, by ensuring that they call their vessels and companies to order to ensure that they do not behave in ways that would, of course, deprive people of their sources of livelihood to the point that they might be tempted or they might be forced to become hopeless prey in the hands of criminal networks. Because sometimes, especially with piracy, a lot of these things that we're talking about, whilst we can say that there is an elite involvement when we talk about piracy, for, for piracy or pirates' activity to be successful, there are different roles by different actors. And the small people you see in communities might play a particular role, either be it as um, acting as informants or be it um, providing their knowledge of the sea to these elites people, of which if these people were duly employed and not deprived, they might not necessarily want to be involved in such a thing, knowing that there is an implication, especially when they are caught by law enforcement. So I feel that there should be a balance in the way when we're saying that maritime security issue is a threat or something that needs to be prioritized, then priority should not be given to one threat, which sort of makes it look like um, you know, certain people are more important than others. So in a nutshell, what I would say that at the international level, there needs to be more honest cooperation and collaboration in the way that one, they are supporting projects, in the way that they're ensuring that um, the support they are given is actually what is needed. That is not a case of, I know what your problems are, here is the solution, but it's a case of, I know that you have this challenge, this set challenge and that challenge, how can we help? Well, we really appreciate your time and your insight today. This has been this has been an awesome interview. Um, before we go, is there anything else that you would like to add or or like to cover that that I didn't ask? No, actually, I don't. Um, I think I guess because of time, we are not able to ask some of the other questions that um, was uh, detailed or sent across. But the only thing I can say from my end is that I've really enjoyed this opportunity to speak to you about these issues because I feel that um, really um, solving a problem requires that different perspectives and different approaches are considered. Because at the end of the day, nobody knows it all. And, and trying to solve a problem based on a particular lens or a particular view can be very problematic, especially when um, there is no real understanding of the social realities on the ground sometimes. So thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for your time today.